At this point then we are ready to actually do some animating. So we're going to take those concepts that we've learned about the poses, about the timing, and create an animation inside Photoshop here. So I'm going to go to File and New, and I'm going to use my template that I have set up here, 1280 by 720, and we'll just do OK. And at this point you want to make sure that you actually have the timeline panel open to do animation inside Photoshop. So we'll go to Window, down to Timeline. And this is what actually uh, is getting better with every release of Photoshop, and it's actually to the point, I feel, where you can do some, some really fun animation with it. So there's two ways you could do this. You could use the video timeline option, but instead I actually prefer to um, just use regular layers on a video timeline. So I'm not going to use a video layer as such, just, uh, just the timeline feature. So we'll do create video timeline. And at this point, it's incredibly important to actually make sure you set your frame rate. Do this first, otherwise it's a little tricky to get it back to um, converting from 30 to 24 frames per second, for example. So we'll click on the little drop down here on the top right of the timeline panel. And we'll go to set timeline frame rate. And we'll set this to the preset of 24. OK. And then what I like to do is actually I've got mine set up so that it's actually looking at the frames rather than the time code. So you want to do that by going to your panel options and I usually use the smallest thumbnails and set it to frame number instead of time code. That way you can precisely measure everything out. Now, by default you will get four seconds of uh, timeline when you first create a video timeline in Photoshop. Now remember the timing that we're going to use for this is one second. So I'm going to have this be 1 to 25. So I'm going to move my background here, starting at 1, going all the way out to 25. It stops at 26, so it lives at frame 25 to 26. This is going to be the length of my walk cycle. Perfect. So what I like to do now at this point is actually set out my timing diagram so I can remember exactly what I'm doing. It's really, really important, especially when you're, you're getting started with animation and you're doing pose to pose. So I'm going to create a new layer here and I'm just going to line this back up. Photoshop loves to give you the full four seconds every time you create a new layer. So we'll look at a workaround for that later. But I'm going to rename this layer to timing. At this point we'll switch over to the pen and we're actually going to draw out a timing diagram. So I'll pick up a black, make sure on the brush tool, and we'll draw out the animation chart here. We're going to go from 1 to 25 and in the middle here we're going to have 13. Remember we're going to have contact, contact, contact. We'll divide these two up again. We're going to get 7, 19, passing, passing. We'll divide these two up again. We're going to get 4, 10, 16, 22. Recoil high point, recoil, high point. That's our flow. So with our timing diagram done, we're now ready to actually start um, adding in some individual frames. And I always like to start with the contact position, so we'll do that first. The contact position is going to start at extreme 1. So we'll move back to frame 1 here, and I'm going to add in a new layer. And I'm actually going to call this layer Temp. And the reason I do this is because of that rather annoying habit of Photoshop giving you four seconds. Now, let's talk about how we're actually going to space these frames out. If I just do frame, space, space, frame at extreme four, space, space, frame at extreme seven, we're going to get blank space in between. So while we're doing the initial rough animation, which is kind of the best way to get started, we're only worrying about every three frames. So 1, 4, 7, 10. 
are essentially animating on threes instead of twos. So what I'm going to do is actually set my temp layer to three frames long. One, two, three. And then every time I need a new layer, all I need to do is right click on temp, duplicate layer, and in this case, this is going to be extreme one. So I'll mark that in, and it's the right length, and I like to color code all of my extremes red, so I know exactly what they are. So we've got extreme one, and we're ready to start drawing our first frame. So we're starting with the contact and I'm going to switch to a blue here, move to the pen tool, or the brush tool I should say, and just set something up which is sort of fairly natural to draw with. And what I like to do, have my pen set up to, is I'll look at the brush settings here. I've got shape dynamics on the pen, uh, set to pen pressure, so we've got the, the different thicknesses, and I've got my transfer set to pen pressure on both the opacity and, the and also the flow, and that gives me the most uh, variation between light and dark. So it's really important to have that on, and I think it gives you a more natural um, effect, if you like. So, you can use your square bracket keys to change the size of your brush, and I'll start off with something fairly thin. I think that works. Okay, so the idea is I like to draw in blue, just kind of like the traditional animators did, and then you can essentially come back later on, and consider these rough layers, and then clean them up with clean layers on top. So, we'll start with the body in this contact position, and we'll sort of make it like this. Try and do a little bit of warm-up beforehand. Maybe your first drawing is typically your worst and the shoulders will be about here and then we can imagine the spine and then the chest and this is Mr. Generic so remember this is just a generic walk cycle that we're doing here it's it's nothing extravagant and you'll apply this same principle to whatever custom characters you decide to use now with the contact position looking at my reference material off to the side here you know that the uh, the character's right leg is going to be straightforward like that. He's reaching out with his foot up in the air. And the back leg is going to be doing the opposite. It's going to be coming back with a slight kink to it because his foot is actually starting to come off the ground, so he's got a little bend there. And before I go in and worry about this too much more, I'm just going to sort of place in a rough head shape. So something like... something like this. I'll come and clean these up a little bit later. In fact, that body's looking a little bit large, so we'll clean this up a little bit. And at this point, I want to set in some kind of reference lines for myself. So I'm going to add in a new layer here, and probably bring this right down just above the timing layer, and I'm going to call this Lines. And if we need to, we can always drag this back. Thank you, Photoshop. And let's mark in a ground plane along here. This is going to give us our point of reference. We'll do the same for the head. Let's mark in that reference plane there. While we're at it, let's mark in a plane for the shoulders as well, and also the lower half of the body. And with these in place, it's going to be so much easier to actually mark out the different reference points of our character as we animate him. So. Let's come back to Extreme 1, and we'll just start drawing or filling out this leg shape here. We'll give him a little foot up in the air like this, and we'll come and do the back leg. Just kind of rough something in like this. Remember, we can always come and clean these up again later. and a little kink there. All right, so that's roughly where he needs to be. And then we can do the arms in the opposite direction. So right foot forward, right arm back. Now thinking about those shoulders, as the hips move forward, the shoulders move back in the other direction, at least on this side. So the arm might be sort of coming down, something like Maybe something like this. I'll just 
give me a little simple hand just to illustrate this. So, other arm is going to be coming in the other direction, and so we're going to be bringing this out something like this, and it's just going to have it down here. He's a gentle character, so he has just he's not really got fists or anything. We'll just keep him simple. All right. There we go, we've got his arms in place, we've got his legs in place. This essentially is our contact position. So the great thing now is that we can come down and we can sort of start to clean this up and you know, I wouldn't stress about it until I was really confident that I'd done the digital equivalent of a pencil test and checked the timing and was happy with it. But for now let's just solidify this so it doesn't look quite so drastic. And remember that it's always a good idea to shade the leg that's furthest away from you in depth so that you know this guy's the left leg. Same with the arm that's furthest away from you, you know that this is the left arm. If you don't do this, it just gets easy to get confused and you know that's just annoying, so let's try and avoid that practice. Come over here, this leg is up front. So we'll do this, bring this guy down here, and just switch the eraser down a little bit here. All right, so the head. The first drawing is in many ways one of the most important because it sets the standard, it sets the scale, the volume for all your other drawings. So. Make sure you're happy with your first drawing before you move on, and while I'm not entirely happy with this, I think it's going to work fine for this example. So, now what I would recommend doing is actually doing your next contact position. So, what we can actually do is duplicate this guy out to begin with, because when you think about it, the first contact position is the same as the last contact position. Now the thing is you don't actually need the last contact position when you do the cycle because as your frames loop you don't want the last contact position being played twice at the end here and at the beginning you'll get a skip or a pause in your animation so we're actually just using this as a reference so I'm going to right click on extreme one duplicate that layer and this will be my last extreme the repetition of that contact position 25 so E 25. It's kept it red. And we're going to drag this guy out all the way over to 25. And if we're working on threes, we would hold this for three. We might as well drag the rest of these layers out as well, keep everything consistent. Now we have contact at the beginning, contact at the end. So it makes sense to just keep dividing everything down, dividing it in half. So the next one we do is the contact for the opposing leg, which would be contact at 13. Now there's a couple of ways you could do this. You could essentially uh, take your first contact, duplicate it, and then just make some alterations to reverse the shading there, and that's one way to do it. But what I actually want to do in this example is draw it from scratch, and I want to make use of onion skinning to do that. So I'm going to duplicate my temp layer here, right click, and I'm going to duplicate this guy. And this will be my extreme 13 for that other contact position. We want to put that above extreme 1, and again it wants to be red. And you would expect to put it about here at 13, but I'm actually going to use a technique of onion skinning in order to, to trace this from the previous one. So I put these side by side, it's, it's a little easier to do this. And what I'll do is I'll come to my drop down in the timeline menu here, and I'm going to go to onion skin settings. And as soon as I do that, you can see that while I'm looking at the blank frame, the previous frame is partially coming through here. In fact, you can even change the opacity here and lower this down if you wanted to, which might be actually quite useful in this case. So I'll put it down to 20. And you can actually step back how many frames you want to be able to see, and we'll do that later. So I'll click OK here. And this is the point where I want to actually create my reverse contact position. So I'll make sure that I've 
got the correct layer selected, I've got my timeline in the correct place, and then I'm going to just come in and just do a quick tracing of this just with our brush tool. Grab this, rough out where the body is here. And this is what a lot of traditional animators would do. They would look at their previous frames, they'd simply retrace them using their light box. And so we're really doing this the digital equivalent of that. And of course the extreme of that would be to simply copy it, but I'm going to try and avoid that in this case. So remember the right leg is coming back. The right leg is closest to us in the depth. So we have to draw it as such. So the right leg is back. I'll trace this out. Something like this. And then the left leg is now forward, but the left leg is furthest away from us. So I'll do something like this, making sure that it looks as though that is hiding underneath the body there. The hips are on the other side. Same for the arms. This is no longer the right arm, this is the left arm. So it's behind the body. So really, if the left or if the left shoulder is actually going to be back, yeah, it would pretty much be in the same sort of position. So let's do that. Just trace this guy over again. and this is behind the body and this time we're going to actually see the right arm is going to be in front of the body so we'll do that we've got to make sure to sort of bring this all the way down and remember that the shoulders are forward in this pose so we'll do something like this just bring it forward Give me a little hand. And then just rough out where the head is. No change in height because it's still a contact position. Something like this. Okay. And before I forget, because it's going to get confusing, remember that this is the left leg. This is furthest away from us. So let's just do a quick shading in here. shade this out. Same with this guy, it's furthest away from us in the depth. So we'll shade this in here. And at this point, we don't really need to rely on the onion skinning anymore. We've got the scale traced out. So I can actually just drag this guy over to where he would be at 13. I can move my time slider over to 13 and temporarily just turn off onion skinning. Then we'll come in here and we'll just sort of solidify this drawing a bit more just to to tidy it up because it's looking a little bit loose. It's hard to get precise drawings with onion skinning on because you know there's so many lines and you, you think you're drawing um, new lines and you're just tracing over the old ones again and again. Something like this. This back arm here. Already I can feel that my drawings are getting a little stiffer because I'm just so much more aware of what I'm doing. Whereas when I do this in practice, it's it's that much looser. So it, it's just something to, to be aware of that the more conscious you are of what you're drawing and how, the importance of that drawing, you tend to sort of stiffen up a little bit. So. It's definitely easier to draw while listening to music or whatever sort of gets you into that right brain mode. Then we'll erase the leg here, something like that. Okay, so now we've got both of our contact positions. We can do a quick roll. If you imagine rolling the paper, if you were a traditional animator, you've got contact one, contact two, contact three. In fact, if we hit space, we'll play it back. Make sure that we've got our preview area from one to our last frame. And in fact, what I'll probably do is just take out 
this last contact position now and just preview it like this. And you can already see, although it's really, really basic, you can see the flipping and you get a very, very rough idea of the timing of the animation. And so at this point, you can decide whether it's too fast, whether it's too slow, and if you need to adjust your timing chart accordingly. But to get a better idea, we really need to start adding in those passing positions. And so that's what we'll do next.